On November 25th, 1983, President Ronald Reagan made an announcement from the White House. Early this morning, forces from six Caribbean democracies and the United States began a landing or landings on the island of Grenada in the Eastern Caribbean. Let there be no misunderstanding. This collective action has been forced on us by events that have no precedent in the Eastern Caribbean and no place in any civilized society. The U.S.-led military operation, the country's largest since the Vietnam War, lasted just nine days. It was a hostage rescue operation, a coup de main, and a Cold War example of regime change. It reflected the Reagan administration's geopolitical and strategic assessment, namely that Soviet and Cuban influence in the Caribbean could be rolled back. Today, few Americans recall these events or could even find tiny Grenada on a map. But it's well remembered among Grenadians who continue to commemorate October 25th, 1983 as Thanksgiving Day. Today, on Coming In From The Cold, Operation Urgent Fury, the 1983 invasion of Grenada. Welcome to Coming In From The Cold, a monthly podcast from CNA, which explores long forgotten or never remembered events, policies, and strategies of the Cold War. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm delighted to have two of my CNA colleagues joining us to discuss this this operation. Uh, first, there's Alex Powell, a research analyst who specializes in, among other things, Special Operations and Special Operations Forces, or SOF. Alex and I recently traveled to Grenada, where we had a firsthand look at the remains of Operation Urgent Fury and at sites of the political violence that contributed to the invasion. More on that a bit later. Alex, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Bill. It's great to be here. Also joining us is longtime friend of the show, Steve Wills, the noted naval historian and author of Strategy Shelled, The Collapse of Cold War Naval Strategic Planning, published by the Naval Institute Press. Former Navy Secretary John Lehman had this to say about Steve's book, and I quote, he has produced a compelling account of how and why good strategy won the Cold War and bad strategy lost three successive wars in the Middle East. It is a must read. Steve. It's wonderful to have you back on Coming In From The Cold. Hey, thanks, Bill, and it's always good to be back here again, so thank you. Wonderful. I think it'd be useful to start with a little background information on the events leading up to Operation Urgent Fury. Here's what the official biography has to say about Morris Bishop, the founder of the Marxist New Jewel movement and a central figure in the island's political dramas leading up to the military operation. And I quote, Eric Gary and his Grenada United Labor Party won the general elections held on November 7th, 1976. On March 13th, 1979, Bishop and his followers seized control of the government of Grenada, while Prime Minister Gary was attending the United Nations session in New York. Proclaiming a people's revolutionary government, Bishop suspended the constitution. Promising new democratic elections, Bishop became prime minister. Bernard Cord became deputy prime minister. Bishop began to build close diplomatic relations with Cuba and the Soviet Union after he took power. He initiated a number of projects, most significantly the building of a new international airport on the island's southern tip. But by late 1982, a deep rift had developed within the Central Committee of the People's Revolutionary Government. A power struggle ensued, mainly over the issue of Cord's desire to have co-equal status. On October 13, 1983, Bishop was placed under house arrest. Alex, you you and I uh, visited Fort Rupert, which subsequently the name reverted to Fort George, its original name. Do you want to talk about what it was like to go in this place and and, uh, what you and I saw? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to, Bill. It was a pretty surreal experience. Now Fort George is perched on 
uh, top of a hill overlooking St. George's, the capital. There's only one way in, very long, steep winding road. And once we got inside the fort itself, we sort of gave ourselves a self-guided tour and we made our way into the courtyard of the fort. The Fort George is where Maurice Bishop and his colleagues were taken by the court's regime and eventually executed. We went to the courtyard and, and this is the place where they were actually executed. And we actually saw the, you know, the wall where they were all stood up and executed. And at this point, it has all been plastered over and in an attempt to cover up that history, essentially, though the plaster is flaking off in certain areas. And so you can see the stone underneath. Uh, another very you know, interesting and surreal experience was finding a very tall metal pole, which now serves as the base for a basketball hoop, but which was riddled with bullet holes. Presumably, the Cords regime fired at Bishop and his colleagues, and some bullets pierced this tall metal rod. Uh, it was definitely a, a very surreal experience. What else do you, you remember from it? I'm with you, Alex. It was a surreal place. It was eerie. The Grenadians were very chill and having us like just wander around. That, that was fun. We talked to a very nice man who, who filled us in on some of the details. You mentioned Cord and Bishop's body was never found, which is despite the best efforts of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the perpetrators of this assassination served long prison sentences. Originally, they were going to be hanged, but they were commuted to life. They've all been released. Anyone who goes to the wonderful island of Grenada, I recommend <laughs> a trip to Fort George. Great views and definitely a Cold War history site. All of these, these events are taking place against this backdrop. The Reagan administration, it's got a growing desire to counter communist presence and influence in the region. And in the view of one senior administration official, I'm going to quote here, Grenada had become a virtual surrogate of Cuba, adding that from Grenada, Moscow could literally place hostile forces and weapon systems capable of striking targets deep in the United States. The military facilities being constructed on the island, the official said, and these military facilities is really a new airport with a 9,000 foot runway. These new facilities, the official said, could provide air and naval bases for the recovery of Soviet aircraft after strategic missions. Most ominously, he added, Grenada might also furnish missile sites for launching attacks against the United States with short and intermediate range missiles. So in other words, yet another Cuban Missile Crisis in the offing, according to the Reagan administration. That's the backdrop. I should also add that there were several hundred American medical students at St. George's University who were effectively hostages. Reagan mentions this at the beginning of his remarks uh, that we played earlier. Why don't we talk a little bit about the operation itself, which was relatively short. Technically, it was nine days long, although most of it was over within within 96 hours. So, Steve, any thoughts on the operation in general terms? I mean, it's described mm -hmm. in, in the DOD official histories as a combined and joint operation. Right. I'm not sure exactly how joint it was. There's some debate about that. It had forces from uh, Barbados, Jamaica, Dominica, other Caribbean states, 7,600 personnel, which included two Army Ranger battalions, mm -hmm. a brigade of the 82nd Airborne Division, a Marine amphibious unit, the Navy aircraft carrier USS Independence and its battle group, Air Force transports, inspector gunships, and some special operations forces, soft. Everybody came to the show, it sounds like. <laughs> Hey, Bill, you're absolutely right. O Operation Urgent Fury is an interesting case study as we examine sort of the evolution of quote unquote jointness in the US military. And this one takes place between, you know, obvious real problems in Vietnam and, you know, later success at the end of the decade in Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. So it's interesting to see where Urgent Fury fits in here. You listed the order of battle. There's a lot about Urgent Fury that looks a lot like what we're used to now. Even in the report itself, 
Department of Defense said they looked very closely at what happened with failed Iranian hostage rescue mission of just a few years before that. Desert One and tried to learn some lessons from there in jointness. They didn't do too badly. Uh, the commander is Admiral Joe Metcalf, very senior naval officer commanding from Independence. And another person we're going to see appear as a future player, then Major General Norman Schwarzkopf is sort of the Army component commander for the operation. At one point, actually, uh, Schwarzkopf gets trapped aboard a Navy amphibious warfare ship trying to get to the beach to command his forces. He can't find a radio that works for him. And this story works its way out, as do others, about problems. Overall, though, the mission is generally successful. There are some casualties that you can, our listeners can check up on in the actual DOD report on the operation. It's on the DOD story and webpage. It's pretty good. But overall, they're successful. They achieved their objectives. It is, as you say, a combined and joint uh, operation. But bits and pieces of what happens gets out because of an emerging movement in the United States that we're not familiar with anymore because it's sort of a Cold War relic, and that's the Military Reform Caucus. This was a very bipartisan group of mostly congressmen, a few senators, defense analysts who were looking for ways to improve the Pentagon and reduce costs in the midst of the Reagan military buildup. And they seize upon a number of issues. There's some immediate criticism that comes from defense analyst William Lynn and other defense analyst Ed Lutvak that gets published very quickly. Uh, they talk about problems with radio communications amongst the various services not being able to talk to each other. There's the famous story, of course, of an Army Ranger, I believe, who couldn't call in an airstrike or artillery, so he had to use his phone card and call back to Fort Bragg and authorize it that way, sort of an early version of our you know, telecommunications world in action at the tactical level of military operations is kind of cool. It gets into cultural world as well because it's the subject of a Clint Eastwood movie. Heartbreak Ridge, where at one point Clint, the recon Marine, growls at his commander, sir, you're boring the hell out of me, or something like that. So, so <laughs> Grenada works its way into the cultural aspects of U.S. military operations in the 1980s as well. Successful by the numbers, but still lots of problems that get picked up. The last thing I'll leave you with, and people might say, well, why are the Cubans so scary? Why would people care? Again, another artifact of the Cold War, Cuba had a major presence in Africa and Angola. And nobody wanted to see another Cuban mercenary organization spring up, especially close to home. The Cuban influence, it's definitely there. Morris Bishop definitely palled around with Castro and Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, setting off alarm bells in the Reagan White House that this communist nexus had emerged and there were certainly Cuban personnel on the island. 64 Cubans died. And Alex, you'll remember yet another part of our visit was a trip to a certain memorial near the airport. You want to talk about that? Memorial for the Cuban martyrs, something like that. Yes. Um, and it's located just next to what was then Point Celine Airport and is now Maurice Bishop International Airport. You know, similarly, sort of perched on top of a small hill right next to the, the airports, we asked our taxi driver to, to drive up there. And contrary to when we visited Pearl's airport, it did not seem as though many people were <laughs> trying to get up there. Uh, <laughs> the, there was barely a paved road and very, very deep potholes greeted us. But once we got up there, it was a nice location overseeing the airport and there was a nice memorial. And I think Fidel Castro inaugurated the memorial on his visit. I think he visited in like 1998 or something. He came back to the island. Is, is that right? I think that's right. And I think that there are pictures of some of these supposed martyrs at the memorial, but all of these martyrs got repatriated to Havana. It's not exactly a um, tourist destination. And he suggested like this taxi driver was sort of I got the impressions like, well, why the hell does anyone want to come up here? Yeah, um, I think that's right. Yeah. But if you're anywhere near the Morris Bishop Airport on your next trip to Grenada, everyone might be worth a look. Just another word about the airport. Airports are important in this operation. I mean, for various reasons. The airport at Port Salines, the one that was being built ostensibly to handle like international passenger travel because the old airport couldn't handle the jets. 
So the Cubans are helping them with it, and that causes concern. But the project had actually had Canadian and, I want to say, British backing. It's hard to say whether this was just some kind of Cuban military installation or whether there maybe was some sense that tourism uh, needed to be developed, which Bishop claimed from time to time. So Cubans on the island, there were paramilitary forces. There were about 500 construction workers and embassy personnel. So a total of 784 Cubans on this island and then various doctors and nurses and technicians of one kind or another. But it was enough to uh, get the attention of the Reagan administration. Why don't we take a quick break? And when we come back, we'll continue our conversation about Operation Urgent Fury. Hi, everyone. CNA is currently hiring. If you're interested in tackling complex real world problems and contributing to our nation's security, consider applying. Right now, our gaming and integration program is hiring a research analyst. You can find more details in our show notes or by visiting cna.org slash careers. We've mentioned Pearl's Airport, which was a scene of, I believe the SEALs had done some kind of uh, reconnaissance the day before the Marines came in and decided that they couldn't do an amphibious landing. And on October 25th, the 2nd Battalion of the 8th Marine Regiment landed at Pearl's Airport using CH-46 Sea Knight and CH-53 Sea Stallion helicopters. Yeah, about 5.30 in the morning of the 25th of October. And they captured Pearl's airport with relatively little resistance. Alex, you and I took a trip out there, didn't we? We, we drove up there, and it's, it's in a, a very rural area at this point. It's, it's not in use as an airfield anymore. It is in use as an area where people learning how to drive in Grenada go. They practice driving on the runway, which was this sort of interesting. There's also a fair amount of farm animals around the airfield, goats and, and cows. And interestingly, there were the remains of one Soviet and one Cuban airplanes, kind of bullet-ridden shells. These airplanes that are just sort of off to the side at Pearls. And I don't know actually what the history is in terms of, you know, whether those were shot at and destroyed during the operation itself, or whether this happened at some other date, or whether there was even a a very large presence of Cuban and Soviet aircraft at Pearls during the landing. Bill, you mentioned that it was a relatively unopposed operation. And and you're right, the the Marines captured the airfield, I think, with relatively minimal resistance. So I'm not exactly sure, you know, how many enemy aircraft were on the airfield at that point. It was a very interesting trip up there. And, you know, aside from seeing the, the airfield itself, there, you know, we also got to see some of the husks of, of various buildings, the, the old immigrations building, you know, customs, a broken down old building that we were told used to be the gift shop at Pearl's. Uh, and actually, you know, part of, of Pearl's has now been turned into you know, an active police station. Isn't that right, Bill? That's right. As you said, it's way up into the hinterlands. It's one of their... Uh... Royal Grenada Police Force, yeah, they call it a a base. It's interesting. It's one of the, maybe the only place in the Caribbean outside of Cuba where there is a remnant of Soviet and Cuban Cold War presence. Kind of an eerie place, but as the taxi driver told us, I take people up here all the time. So Cold War enthusiasts are uh, definitely have that on their radar, and it's well worth a visit. Hey, Bill, just checking the official report. It does say that the Marines encountered some light resistance at Pearls. Sounds like there was some resistance. There was resistance. And there and there was Point Salines where the other airport was being built. And uh, St. George's, the capital of Grenada, there was definitely considerable Cuban resistance. So that's one of the things about this operation. It, you know, it's the subject of, I guess, some debate. We didn't know much about the Cuban presence. In fact, our intelligence wasn't particularly good. And according to a story in the Military Times about the run-up to the invasion, planners with the U.S. Army's 82nd Airborne Division 
were unable to find any maps of Grenada anywhere at Fort Bragg. In an inspired moment, a division staff officer headed for downtown Fayetteville, where he procured tourist maps of the island. It's kind of amazing <laughs> that they were <laughs> tourist maps of Grenada in Fayetteville of all places, but he industriously procured these, these maps. Planners superimposed a military grid atop the map and distributed copies to the invading troops before they boarded their aircraft. Interestingly, many senior leaders were relying on articles copied out of The Economist magazine for the most up-to-date intelligence on the island. Um, General Vesey, the chairman at that time, when, when questions about this said, well, you know, we only had 48 hours to plan this operation. So if the chairman only had 48 hours to put it together, then I suspect that you know, units further down in the echelon and chain of command probably had even less time. There's lots of good stories like that, though. In one case, Rangers are trying to get off the Salinas airfield and they decide to hot wire a bulldozer and use it to clear <laughs> obstacles on the runway. I mean, you can't yeah. make this stuff up. And then I think Clint Eastwood used all this in his movie later, too. Those Rangers, they're special operators. They can improvise and uh, get the job done in creative ways. I wanted to talk and get your thoughts really on some of the criticisms of this operation ex post facto. Steve, you've already mentioned some, mm -hmm. but also there were people who considered it a, a tremendous success. I mean, I always, in a very amateur way, I, I sort of thought of it as kind of borderline farcical, but it certainly wasn't. The British prime minister at the time, Margaret Thatcher, was extremely annoyed that she hadn't been told ahead of time about the invasion. Uh, she kept that to herself and publicly supported it, not surprising given her close relationship with Ronald Reagan. And on November 2nd, 1983, by a vote of 108 to 9, the United Nations General Assembly, perhaps predictably, condemned the invasion as, quote, a flagrant violation of international law <laughs> and the independent sovereignty and territorial integrity of Grenada. And also, perhaps not surprisingly, the United States vetoed the UN Security Council resolution that condemned the operation. But you have those criticisms. And then you have, if we could, Steve, dive a little more into the sort of, uh, I would say, not strategic, but maybe operational. Sure criticisms of of the operation? Well, there, there were a lot of critiques about communication between the various components that this becomes much like a Vietnam operation where the services are fighting side by side and not together. But we aren't really there yet in terms of mobilizing the services like this. So there's some basic planning that takes place. And it did happen over a very short period of time. So it's an ad hoc organization we don't have a command structure in that part of the world to carry it out. It becomes SACLANT, Supreme Allied Commander Atlantic. Uh, another artifact of the Cold War when we had a four-star naval joint force commander whose whole mission was fighting in the North Atlantic, getting convoys and supplies across the Atlantic to NATO, fighting the Russians and so forth. But they're, they're more interested in Soviet submarines and not in invading Caribbean islands. So it's kind of out of their expertise area to begin with. But there are communication problems, as I said, between the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps components that take place throughout this. Uh, as I said, a couple of influential defense analysts, Ed Lutvok and Bill Lynn, seize upon this. And it's also convenient that at the same time, the U.S. Congress is considering defense reorganization reform at this point. There's still sort of the building consensus after Vietnam that the services just couldn't fight together at the operational level. It's one thing to plan strategically together. And we know that services at Washington squabble over funds and don't always, or it's, it's, it's claimed don't work in the nation's best interest, but rather in their own. But as you said, at the operational level, there was concern that, you know, you couldn't communicate uh, the story I said about General Schwarzkopf. And as you and Alex brought up, there were some problems with the various special forces. The Navy SEALs fight their way in and then have to be relieved by the Army Rangers. So it does, if you're looking at this operation from Washington, D.C., it might very well appear that the services are fighting separate operations where the Navy and the Marine Corps are doing one thing, Army Rangers are doing something else, and that looks very poorly coordinated. I don't know. In my own assessment, I call it an interim operation along sort of the timeline between 
real failures and problems with executing the Desert One hostage rescue mission during the Carter administration and moving all the way forward to 1990, 1991, where you have a very successful Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield. So consider it an interim stop along the way with some challenges, although the operation by all of its numbers is very, very successful. Uh, and some people at the time pointed that out. Why are you critiquing the services? They did something right. You know, there weren't any hostages killed. Not that long before, I think it's 1974, you have the Mayaguez incident off Cambodia, where the crew of U.S. cargo ship is taken hostage by the Khmer Rouge, and services go in to try and free them, and it's a disaster. There are a number of casualties and so forth, and then the Cambodians eventually just release the U.S. crew. So we don't have the same kind of problem. So it's successful, but it's still seized upon as emblematic of the need for defense reform. Yeah, I just want to um, quote an army captain who, in 1986, he's writing in the Army's Military Re Review Journal, and he says this about the campaign, kind of going along with what you said just a moment ago, Steve. 599 U.S. and 80 foreign students were evacuated without injury. Civil order was restored. Cuban, Soviet, and various Eastern Bloc representatives were removed from the island. The casualty toll was relatively light. 18 U.S. troops were killed in combat. One died of wounds. 115 were wounded. And 28 suffered non-hostile injuries. The Cubans lost 24 killed, 59 wounded, and 605 captured, and were later returned to Cuba. The Grenadian People's Revolutionary Army, the PRA, suffered 21 killed and 58 captured. There were 24 Grenadian civilians killed during the operation. Admiral Wesley L. McDonald, mentioned earlier by Steve. Zach Lant. Yeah. Commander, yep, Zach Lant, said, in summary, history should reflect that the operation was a complete success. But of course, not everyone, not everyone agreed. This came shortly after the barracks bombing in Beirut in 1983. And there's some speculation that the Reagan administration was eager to sort of, I don't know, not redress that, but to come out with a strong response that the United States wasn't going to, you know, be pushed around. I don't know, Steve, have you? I've seen, I've seen that kind of reporting before. I think the one challenge here is the timeline. It's just days after, and it's a very short, short timeline. I mean, you've got U.S. ground forces in Grenada starting on the 25th of October, correct me if I'm wrong there. Uh, 1983. And the Beirut bombing incident takes place on October 23rd. So even the United States military would be hard pressed to turn that around quickly. Maybe they push the go button faster to, to get it going. That's distinctly possible. Maybe we have to wait to get that declassified. There's still a lot of hidden Cold War stuff out there that hasn't been fully publicized yet, but that's certainly possible. And it might account for part of the challenges with the very short timeline for planning that the chairman, General Vesey, spoke about when questioned by Congress in November of 1983, just after. Just an aside, I wanted to mention yet another criticism of the operation from the Soviets. And this is according to the great historian of intelligence, Christopher Andrew, quoting from the Matrokin archive of KGB documents. He quotes Vice President Vasily Kuznetsov, who in this internal document accused the Reagan administration of, quote, making delirious plans for world domination, which were pushing mankind to the brink of disaster. So <laughs> this actually is occurring at an interesting time in U.S.-Soviet relations because you have the uh, Able Archer exercises, you have Operation Ryan, you have this really growing uh, and very intense paranoia within the Kremlin and drop off is sick. All his minions are are basically freaking out about Reagan as this warmonger. And this kind of just seems to confirm in their own growing paranoia that the United States is bent on global domination. So there you have it. It's at the height of the evil empire speech period in the Reagan career. As you know, Bill, many historians look back on this period, perhaps, as one where, where Reagan is, is talking about bombing the Soviets out of existence in that unguarded press slip where he thought he was not online at the moment, uh, the evil empire speech, and then, you know, after Abel Archer, a move to a more conciliatory Reagan and so forth. So that bigger timeline, Bill, I agree with you, is, is interesting. 
We've covered a lot of ground today. It's a complicated story, but an absolutely fascinating one. Alex and Steve, any final thoughts before we wrap up? I would echo Steve's point, you know, about this as sort of a stepping stone, but specific to the context of SOF, seeing the evolution of special operations forces from the failures of Desert One, the, you know, the failed Iranian hostage rescue attempt through to the successes that we'll see later down the line. This is kind of a stepping stone in that evolution. And I would certainly agree with what Alex said there, too. It, it is a stepping stone. And even though the operation is very successful, Successful. If you measure it by its own objectives, those points that, that we've talked about, the, the communications issues, some of the planning issues, the fact that the services seem to be fighting separate campaigns here and, and special forces fighting a separate campaign from the main services get seized upon by this mass of congressional and, and other critics of the Defense Department at this time. Eventually, as, as Bill pointed out earlier, it all leads back to the Goldwater Nichols Act of 1986. And again, uh, a lot of these points get used by Senator Goldwater and some of his comments and certainly by his staff and Bill Nichols staff and some of the other people that work on this. Uh, Bill Lynn becomes one of those people, too, that provides commentary. It all feeds back to what takes place then in 1985 and 1986 with this legislation, which, you know, you see kind of come to fruition in Desert Shield and Desert Storm a few years later. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. I want to thank Alex Powell and Steve Wills for a wonderful conversation. And as always, thanks to our estimable producer, John Stimson. And most important, I'd like to thank you, our listeners. Be sure to check out the show notes for coming in from the cold. We've got uh, links to additional resources that'll be of interest, as well as photographs that Alex and I took in Grenada of the various sites that we've mentioned. Please join us again for another episode of Coming In From The Cold. In the meantime, stay warm out there. Coming In From The Cold is produced, edited, and mixed by John Stimson. Our theme music is by Edward Grenga. If you enjoy our show, we'd love it if you'd leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends about us. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next month.